worst disaster in decades. More than 10,000 injured, thousands more killed, and the death toll keeps climbing after major earthquakes rocked Turkey and Syria. Rescue teams are now in a desperate search for survivors. Plus, no, this is bipartisan. This is black, white, red, yellow, Democrat, Republican. You know, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about people having clean drinking water. Our daily prime focus brings you the humanity behind the headlines. Tonight, Rachel Scott goes to Jackson, Mississippi for an exclusive look at the city's water system and the failures hitting communities. And Bill Russell literally invented modern defensive basketball. He changed the game from a horizontal game played by mostly landlocked Caucasians into the game that we know today. The man, the legend, the force to be reckoned with, Bill Russell, and the fight he waged for human rights. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're covering those stories and much more, including the train derailment prompting urgent evacuations in Ohio, with crews scrambling to avert a massive explosion. And the brewing legal fight being waged by an AGs from 20 states in a bid to stop one of the country's largest pharmacies from mailing abortion pills. We talked to the attorney general who is spearheading that effort. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country and around the world, covering all that and more tonight. But we begin with the devastation and despair in Turkey and Syria. Thousands killed by a catastrophic earthquake. Aerial show demolished buildings and scenes resembling a war zone. Rescue workers urgently scrambling to try to save lives. As the night air fills with the cries of desperate survivors not knowing what will be their future, paired with disbelief of the destruction, others are just trying to stay dry and warm amid the frigid temperatures by gathering around fires and bundling up. Lives and livelihoods decimated in just a matter matter of minutes. ABC News foreign correspondent Marcus Moore leads us off tonight from Istanbul. Tonight, the most powerful earthquake to hit Turkey in 100 years, striking in the middle of the night as millions were sleeping. Videos showing the moment that 7.8 magnitude quake hit. You can hear the shaking and see power flashes. This town plunged into darkness. The danger persisting through the day. Clouds of debris billowing into the street as this building collapses. The region rocked by at least 75 aftershocks. First responders on the scene of this collapsed building when the one next to it comes crashing down too. This reporter covering the urgent search and rescue efforts when the earth shakes again. People running for their lives. You can hear the buildings collapsing. Witnesses turning around to see this. <laughs> Moments later, spotting a mother and her children racing to help them get to safety. <laughs> wait, wait, this man says, as the frantic search for survivors began before dawn. Rescuers pausing here to listen for signs of life. And glimmers of hope as first responders pull this survivor from the debris. After daybreak west of Aleppo, rescuers lifting an injured child from the rubble. And to the north of the city, saving this toddler. Her name is Raghat. But sadly, her mother and two siblings all killed. The little girl now staying with relatives. In Turkey, rescuers pulling this man out of a tiny crevice of a collapsed building. This survivor named Hulusi comparing the quake to doomsday. <laughs> Saying a building collapsed on him and his wife. He doesn't think she survived. <laughs> Whoa! Across the quake zone, the death toll rising steadily throughout the day. We now know more than 3,700 people were killed. The sheer horror, rescuers recovering the body of a newborn baby. The infant's father overcome with grief, holding his baby, collapsing to his knees. <laughs> this woman named Imran, desperate for word from her daughter and her family. But that's the next side of the The bedroom was right over there, she says. And at this overwhelmed hospital, a doctor making this plea. We uh, have information that uh, hundreds of patients are still under the debris. Uh, the situation is too bad. We need urgent help. And tonight, those trapped in the debris screaming for help. Speak out loud, this man says. Help, help, a woman responds. 
At least 45 countries pledging support, including the United States. President Biden speaking with Turkey's President Erdogan late today, saying U.S. search and rescue teams are, quote, deploying quickly to the region. Really hard to watch that. Marcus Moore joins us now. Uh, Marcus, what's the plan going forward as far as continuing to search for survivors? We understand some inclement weather is also causing more difficulty. Yeah, Lindsay, there's an urgent effort still underway as we speak right now as they try to find uh, the people, the families, and, and everyday people uh, beneath the rubble. And that is work that will go on as long as it needs to happen. But the next 24 to 48 hours will be critical in the search for survivors. We know that more than 5,600 buildings fell here in Turkey and in Syria, trapping scores of people in the rubble. And as you mentioned, the weather here is brutally cold, below freezing temperatures, along with winter snow is now falling on those devastated towns and villages. Lindsay. All right, Marcus Moore for us reporting in from Istanbul. Thank you, Marcus. An urgent call to evacuate in Ohio tonight amid fears of an imminent explosion after a train carrying toxic chemicals derailed. Now the dangerous operation to drain the toxic liquid from inside the cars is underway. Once that's complete, there will be controlled burns to destroy the cars and to avoid a blast. Our Alex Perche is in Ohio tonight with the very latest. Tonight, that towering column of smoke and flames, authorities burning chemicals at the site of the massive train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, 20 miles south of Youngstown. Five of those cars carrying vinyl chloride. It's used to make plastic. It's toxic and extremely flammable. Have you ever seen something like this? No, I've never experienced anything like this. Authorities deciding late today to conduct the controlled release, making small holes in the cars, draining the chemicals into a trench. Inside that trench will be flares lining that trench that then will light off the material. This allows us to control that operation and not have the car react and do it itself. Officials expanding the evacuation zone for a possible toxic plume from that release, now extending over the Pennsylvania border. Those in the red area, those in the red area, are facing grave danger of death if they are still in that area. Janet Meek and her family got out after officials warned of an imminent explosion late last night. It hit that something bad's gonna happen and we just need to, to leave. The 150-car Norfolk Southern Railroad train was headed to Pennsylvania from Illinois when it derailed Friday night. The NTSB is studying the train's data recorder and videos that may show mechanical issues with one of the rail cars. Alex Perche joins us now from Ohio, just outside of the evacuation zone. Alex, officials are monitoring the air quality and the water at this point? That's right, Lindsay, because they're very concerned. But tonight, Norfolk Southern says that controlled release was completed successfully, but the State Emergency Management Service says that they're going to be continuing to monitor the air and the water over the next coming days and weeks. Lindsay? Alex Perche for us. Thanks so much, Alex. Now to the search for the remnants of that Chinese spy balloon off the coast of South Carolina. It was brought down over the weekend by a missile from an F-22 jet. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raditz has the details. Tonight, a military recovery crew combing a vast expanse of ocean, 15 football fields by 15 football fields wide, looking for pieces of that Chinese spy balloon. The balloon brought down over the weekend by a missile fired from an F-22 fighter jet. Frank one, last one. The balloon is completely destroyed. We got it. Boom! Oh, yeah. Woo! Back on land, cameras capturing the spectacle. The Pentagon saying they have already recovered portions of the balloon, which spanned 200 feet and carried a technology bay the size of three buses. A special team trained in handling explosives heading out to the site in the event that the debris contains hazardous material. Unmanned underwater vehicles will sweep for scraps. Officials insist the U.S. will gather valuable information from the debris, already revealing new details. The balloon had propellers, they say, and a rudder. The balloon had the ability to, to maneuver itself, to speed up, to slow down, uh, and to turn. Senior administration officials say the balloon first entered American airspace over Alaska on January 28th before heading into Canada and then re-entering the continental U.S. last Tuesday. Came over the United, into the United States 
from Canada. I uh, told the Defense Department wanted to shoot it down as soon as it was appropriate. The balloon was allowed to drift over the nation until Saturday. The Pentagon determined shooting it down over land would risk lives on the ground. Martha Raddatz joins us now. And Martha, it sounds like this actually isn't the first time that a Chinese spy balloon has flown into American airspace. It, it isn't, Lindsay. There have been at least four other incursions in recent years. They were very different, very brief, one off the coast of Hawaii, others along the U.S. coast. But the really frightening part about that is the U.S. military, NORAD, did not know about those incursions until afterwards. Today, the head of NORAD said, it's my responsibility to detect threats in North America. I will tell you that we did not detect those threats, and that's an awareness gap that we have to figure out. Fortunately, Lindsay, they did detect this one and shot it down. Lindsay? A lot of concern about those that went undetected, of course. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. Tomorrow night, when President Biden addresses the nation, he'll face a deeply divided Congress and a disgruntled American public. An ABC News poll found that President Biden has just 37 percent approval on his handling of the economy, 38 percent on the war in Ukraine, and 28 percent on immigration at the Mexican border. Earlier, I spoke with White House Deputy Communications Director Kate Berner. Ms. Berner, thank you so much for talking with us on the eve of the State of the Union. Uh, the president, of course, faces a lot of headwinds. How is he planning on taking them all on? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Lindsay. Look, tomorrow night, the president is going to deliver the State of the Union. He's going to speak directly and plainly to the American people. He's going to talk about the strength and the resilience of our country and of our uh, workers and families across the country. He's going to talk about the incredible progress that we've made in two years since he's been in office, more than 12 million jobs created, lower prescription drug costs, a manufacturing boon across the country, a re invigorated global alliance to support Ukraine. But he's going to talk about the work that, as you said, you know, we need to continue to do, how we need to continue to build on that progress, to grow our economy, create more good paying jobs and lower costs for families. And you touched on it there. The economy, of course, seems to stand out as perhaps the biggest source of discontent among voters. In the ABC News poll, 41 percent said that they are worse off now than when President Biden took office. That's the highest that it's been in 37 years. What's the president's response to people who say that the initiative that he's promoting simply aren't helping them make ends meet. Well, look, I think it's important we not over-index on any one poll, just like, you know, we here don't over-index on any one economic indicator. When the president took office, the economy was in free fall, main streets were shuttered, millions were uh, didn't have a job. What we're seeing now is a historic economic recovery, uh, an unemployment rate that's the lowest it's been in more than 50 years, an unemployment rate for black and Latino Americans that's near historic lows. We're seeing families with more money, uh, what our economists call household balance sheets and we're seeing just starting to see progress in implementing the president's plans to give families more breathing room lower gas prices lower prices for clean energy and of course those lower prescription drug prices for seniors across the country so we're going to continue to build on that progress and build on the president's plan it's important you know whole layout what he won't do also and what Republicans in Congress have supported, cutting Social Security and Medicare, uh, make, raising taxes on working families. So the president believes that this important inflection point, we have to continue our progress to build an economy from the bottom up and middle out, not the top down. And unfortunately, there's some in Congress who disagree with that approach. And as he said, he'll veto any legislation that does any of those things like cut Social Security or Medicare. What goals can we expect President Biden to outline tomorrow night? And, and what's his strategy for getting them approved by the, the Republican-led House? Well, look, the president is proud of his record getting things done in Congress on a bipartisan basis, whether that's the infrastructure law, gun legislation, uh, the Right to Marry Act, the PACT Act, uh, the Chips and Science Act. So he has signed, you know, hundreds of bipartisan bills into law as president. The president believes that the American people sent him and sent members of Congress here to Washington to deliver results, to get things done for the American people. And that means the American people expect Republicans in Congress to work with him. Many of the proposals the president has put forward, whether it's paid leave or an assault weapons ban, those are brought bipartisan across the country and they should be bipartisan Congress as well. And just lastly, as we look ahead to the next election, our polling found that nearly six in 10 Democrat aligned adults don't want to see Biden renominated for the job. Is he at all ready to consider making room for another Democratic candidate? 
Well, I think as you know, Lindsay, there's only so much I can say that from here as a White House spokesperson on the North Lawn, the president has spoken to his intentions. I'm not going to get ahead of that. And the president and the team here, we're all very proud of the accomplishments um, from his first two years in office and looking forward to hear him uh, talk about that and more tomorrow night. White House Deputy Communications Director Kate Berner, we thank you so much for your time and insight. And a reminder, you can tune in back here tomorrow night as we kick off our special coverage of the State of the Union Address and Republican Response. That's at 7 p.m. Eastern here on Prime. The alleged jihadist who is charged with attacking three New York City police officers on New Year's Eve is now out of the hospital. 19-year-old Trevor Bickford entered a Manhattan federal court in shackles today. He's charged with attempting to kill officers who were patrolling Times Square ahead of the ball drop. Bickford was taken into federal custody after his release from the hospital. He's scheduled to appear in state court later this week to face separate charges. He's being held without bail and will be back in federal court on February 20th. The FBI arrested two people in an alleged plot to attack energy substations across Baltimore on a single day. Prosecutors say that they were fueled by a racist extremist ideology and aimed to, quote, completely destroy the city. Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, has more. Tonight, the FBI accusing two suspected radicals fueled by racial hate of plotting to target the city of Baltimore's electrical grid in the hopes of causing pain and chaos. The accused were not just talking but taking steps to fulfill their threats and further their extremist goals. The FBI says this is Sarah Beth Clendaniel wearing a mask and holding an assault rifle. Her alleged plan... ...to shoot multiple electrical substations in the Baltimore area, aiming to, quote, completely destroy this whole city. Clendaniel's alleged partner in crime, Brandon Russell, the founder of the neo-Nazi group Adam Waffen only recently out of prison for possessing illegal explosives. The FBI claims Russell wanted to inflict as much pain as possible on the predominantly black city of Baltimore, writing to an undercover FBI informant that he wanted to carry out the attack when there's the greatest strain on the grid. Russell stating that such an attack could lead to cascading failure, costing billions of dollars. Pierre Thomas joins us now. Pierre, is the FBI worried at this point about an unsettling trend of substation attacks or planned attacks? Yes, they are. FBI and Homeland Security officials have warned in recent bulletins that white supremacists and other radicals are plotting to attack the electrical grid. There have been several such assaults on substations across the nation in recent months, Lindsay, including multiple unsolved incidents in North Carolina. All right, Pierre Thomas for us from the nation's capital. Thanks so much, Pierre. Pleasure. Turning now to a close call between planes at Austin's International Airport. This weekend, a FedEx jet flew over the top of a Southwest Airlines flight. According to the NTSB, there were 123 passengers and five crew members on board the flight and three crew members on the FedEx plane. They came within 100 feet of each other. The FAA and NTSB are both investigating the incident. Federal rules require that departing or landing flights are clear of the runway before another plane is cleared onto the same strip. United Airlines is facing a fine of more than a million dollars after allegedly conducting flights where the planes did not meet airworthiness requirements. Today, the FAA proposed the fine after United allegedly removed the fire system warning check from its Boeing 777 pre-flight checklist from 2018 to 2021. The warning check is a required inspection task. United Airlines operated more than 100,000 flights during that time. United changed its pre-flight checklist in 2018 to account for redundant built-in checks, and the FAA approved of that change, United Airlines said in a statement that the safety of their flights was never in question. Now we turn to the latest front in the debate over access to abortion, the U.S. mail. Earlier this month, the Justice Department gave the okay for the Postal Service to deliver drugs that could produce an abortion to states that have banned the procedure. Walgreens and CVS pharmacies have applied for certification to provide the pills through their online pharmacies. But attorneys general from 20 states with strict abortion bans have issued a stark warning that doing so would violate federal and some state laws. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey wrote the letter. He joins us now. Attorney General Bailey, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight. First, can you explain to us the U.S. Justice Department has said that mailing these pills, which can have a various of uses, that it does not violate federal law. Why do you and your fellow attorneys general believe that it does? 
Well, it's a flawed reading of the statute, and someone somewhere is going to hold the Biden administration and these unelected federal bureaucrats accountable because shipping abortion drugs through the mail absolutely does violate the plain text of federal statute and state law here in Missouri. And so for us, this is about protecting the rule of law. It's about protecting women and protecting children. Why did you decide to spearhead this multi-state warning to the pharmacies? Well, at this point, the state's are the vanguard in the fight against the rise of the unelected federal administrative state and state attorneys general are the tip of the spear in that fight. And I'm proud to be leading this effort of 20 states, 20 like-minded attorneys general who believe like I do, that it's worth standing up and saying no and fighting back in order to protect children and protect the health of women. Some, including abortion opponents, have expressed concern that this could result in the prosecution of women who receive the medications via email. Is that your intent? Certainly not. This is not about prosecuting women. It's about protecting women's health and protecting children and holding corporations accountable if they attempt to violate state and federal law. Some, including abortion opponents, have expressed concern that this could result in the prosecution of women who receive the medications via the mail. Is that your intent? No, the, the law doesn't permit prosecution of, of women who obtain the drugs. It, it, the, the law is it, it designed and intended to prevent the shipment of the drugs in the first place. And that's what our letter is all about. It's directed towards the, the pharmacies who would ship the abortion drugs through the mail. Because I would also point out that these drugs are proven to be harmful. They're harmful to the health of the children, first and foremost, but they're six times more likely to cause complications for women. And so the, the health and safety of the women is codified in the prohibition of the shipment of these drugs. And the prohibition is against the pharmacies from doing it. And that's why we're standing up to protect the rule of law and enforce the laws as written. So I want to pick up on, on your idea there that it's harmful. In your letter to the pharmacies, you specifically say that medication abortion is higher risk than other methods. The American Medical Association and American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists consider the method to be safe and effective. In terms of the women's health and safety, what is your concern? Because you're saying that it's harmful. These doctors who specialize in abortions say that it's not. Well, the research runs counter to what they're saying, but also I would point out that the health and safety concerns, the health and safety of the women and children are codified in state and federal statute. The policymakers in government, our elected representatives have spoken on this issue. And again, that's why it's about protecting the rule of law for us as much as it, as it is about protecting the health and safety of women and children. And I realize also you're saying you're trying to protect the, the women and children. Um, if the women have decided based on their own conversations with their doctors, Doctors, that this is a safe uh, alternative for them, then why not let them take the risk? I mean, risk comes with a lot of different kinds of medications, no? Well, it's a rule of law issue for us. And I think that, again, is expressed in, in our letter. And 19 other state attorneys general agree with that proposition that we've got to stand up and enforce the laws as written. The plain text of the statute means something. And so unelected federal bureaucrats in the Biden administration don't get to read out or read around the law by enacting it uh, and promulgating a rule that undermines the, the will of the people as expressed through their elected representatives. So we're going to fight to enforce the rule of law. Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey, we thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you, ma'am. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, the new details from police on a crime they say happened just moments before officers shot and killed a double amputee. But next, our prime focus of the night, Jackson, Mississippi residents are struggling without steady access to clean water, and they could be waiting for years for real change. Our Rachel Scott has exclusive access inside Jackson's water system and looks at what's falling through the cracks for this predominantly African-American community. This is a, this is really a failed system from an infrastructure standpoint. But at this point, you haven't found all the problems you just Not said. Not even close. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it.
This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from New York, I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hey everybody, we're back with our prime focus of the night where we give viewers a look at the humanity behind the headlines. Tonight, we go to Jackson, Mississippi, where residents are still in a fight for clean water. A recent wave of federal funding came with a promise that help would be on the way, but it may take years to see real progress. In the meantime, the city's predominantly African-American population feels the impact of America's failing infrastructure each and every day. Our senior congressional correspondent, Rachel Scott, takes a look in her new series that follows the money of major federal aid programs and the people in communities falling through the cracks. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. These fifth graders at Wilkins Elementary School should be in the classroom right now. Can you all be careful, boys? It's not time for recess. This is not a study break. In fact, these students were pulled out of class to help load donations of water off this pickup truck and into their elementary school. They're just 10 to 11 years old, carrying stacks of water half their size. Be careful, boys. Be careful, be careful. For much of the year, nothing from the faucets is safe to drink. The sound of plastic. A signal to students in nearby classrooms that today Wilkins will have access to safe drinking water. But that's not always a guarantee. And what is your product? Good job, good job. Amy Stewart is teaching math to fourth graders in one of those nearby classrooms. We waste water. We do not waste water. It's too precious. On weeks where donations are low, Amy buys water for her students with money out of her own pocket. It just seemed like we're forgotten. We're just forgotten right here. We've been following this school for over a year. Months ago, the water pressure was so low, students were forced to use porter potties outside. Principal Cheryl Brown helping kindergartners line up. There you go. I look at our younger students. All right, now you stay right here. All they know in a school is a school where they have had to go outside to porter potties. That's degrading. It's inhumane on all levels. And there's no way we can go back and redeem that time, no matter how hard we try. Should conditions like these be acceptable for any student? No, indeed. No, indeed. The time spent waiting in line is time not spent in the classroom yeah. learning. On one of our visits, there was no water pressure at all. Not even those portable restrooms could work. And this district often has to switch to remote learning with little notice, leaving parents scrambling. The school is still without water. So we're doing virtual from home today. He said use the but the teachers here say they are determined to not let their students be defined by the circumstances. You all did such a great job today. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. If I give up, say forget it because of what's going on now. I will not fail them, not at all, not at all. They deserve it, a fair chance. They deserve it. See you, see you, see you. What's happening at Wilkins is happening all across Jackson. More than 300 boil water notices have been issued in the last two years alone. That means entire weeks could go by without access to clean water from the city. No water pressure, no water. Dry. We get up Christmas morning to open gifts. My wife wants to wash her face. And the biggest Christmas present we got was nothing out of our pipes. At town halls, hundreds of frustrated residents packing in, demanding answers. Why should we have to feel like we in a third world country? But the water crisis in Jackson didn't happen overnight. 
there have been years of finger pointing. Local Democratic leaders say Republicans have left behind a capital city where over 80% of the residents are black and a quarter of the population lives below the poverty line. What I have done is challenge the leadership of the state in order to address the failure to fund Jackson over time. Republican leaders pushing back, denying those claims. The water struggles in Jackson were specific to the incompetence of this administration and this mayor. The EPA recently launched an investigation looking into whether state officials discriminated against Jackson on the basis of race. Reeves has denied ABC News' repeated requests for an interview, but we spoke to EPA Administrator Michael Regan. I know equity is so important for you and the EPA. Transparency. How critical is transparency? You know, in a city like Jackson, we're not only rebuilding the infrastructure, we were building our trust with the community. The community has to have trust in their government. And the problems in Jackson have led to a rare intervention by the Justice Department, a federal takeover of Jackson's water system. Nothing like starting a new job this way, huh? The man standing at the front answering questions during this town hall is Ted Hennepin, the third party manager appointed by a federal judge to try to find solutions. Hennepin has only been on the job for a few months, but the problems here in Jackson go back decades. A crumbling water plant in desperate need of repair. He tells me he hasn't even found all the problems yet. This is really a failed system from an infrastructure standpoint. How important is it to have someone who is a third party independent voice working think, on this? I think it's really important here because the politics are incredibly challenged. He took us inside the OB Curtis water treatment plant, giving our cameras exclusive access at the city's main water treatment facility. This is the start of what every Jackson resident wants, clean, every day. safe <laughs> drinking water. And we've been really good at producing it, unfortunately. We've had these gaps where you can't keep the pressure up because the system's full of leaks, can't get all the production out of here because we're missing some critical parts. All those things contribute to these episodes where we've had these, these disasters. Emergency fixes are just about everywhere. This is a temporary setup because that pipe's crushed. And how long has this workaround been in place? As far as I know, it's been maybe eight, 10 years. When something goes wrong at the water plant, the impact will soon be felt by Jackson residents like Glenda Barner. I try not to think about it. I just, I get up and I walk in the bathroom when I first get up and I turn the water on. I say, oh, it's a good day. I've got good, you know, clean looking running water. And that's another thing, clean looking. Do you trust that I the don't, water is safe? No, I don't. I don't drink it. I don't. I have not drank Jackson City water in years. I always buy bottled water for me to drink. Still washing my cabbage grains. The grandmother of seven often has to prepare meals for her entire family just using bottled water. She can go through three cases of water on just one meal. We shouldn't have to go through this. We really shouldn't. But, you know, what can we do? We rely on our officials to do what they need to do to fix it and it's not getting done. The Biden administration awarded billions in funding for more than 7,000 road, bridge, and clean water projects across the country. Never again can we allow what happened in Flint, Michigan, and Jackson, Mississippi. Can never let it happen again. Mississippi received $429 million to address water infrastructure directly. We asked the mayor for an update. None of the money has been allocated at this time, uh, and the uh, application process has not been released by the state. But there was an application process. ABC News has learned leaders in Jackson did not apply for any funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law passed last year and only recently applied in 2023. You depend on your city, your federal, and your state government to help you in times like this. But they're having infighting over the politics of it. You know, they say they're allocating money. Where's the money? Who's spending the money? What's the money being spent on? The state is now expected to submit a plan to the EPA for how that money will be spent, mandating that nearly 50% go to disadvantaged communities like Jackson. But you also have uh, an EPA administrator that has the ability to hold all parties accountable if they don't cooperate to ensure that we find a solution for the people of Jackson. Even without the money from the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the city of Jackson is still receiving more than $800 million of federal funds. 
some of that from EPA grants, the American Rescue Plan, and Congress. Hennepin is in charge of figuring out where that goes. In a newly released financial plan obtained by ABC News, Hennepin lays out how he intends to fix the city's water distribution system and address leaks. Investments that could make Jackson's water system financially self-sustainable. But it will take time. The plan spans 20 years, though some improvements will be seen in the first five. What do you tell residents when you hear from them about their frustrations, um, especially those that are losing patience? Tom, I still I can't do it any faster than we're doing. I think we've got the best tool in place now with the resources to make it happen. So a little bit more patience maybe, which is hard to ask. Um, they, they've suffered, it's been terrible. Residents are where they have been for years, waiting for something to change, still keeping hope that one day avoiding tap water will not be a way of life. You know, this is bipartisan. This is black, white, red, yellow, Democrat, Republican. You know, it's not about me, it's not about you. It's about people having clean drinking water. Clean drinking water just seems like it would be the bare minimum. Rachel Scott joins us now. Some powerful words there from that Jackson resident feeling these problems firsthand. So Rachel, this is gonna be an ongoing series. Explain what your focus is on going forward. Yeah, Lindsay, well, so often you know this, we cover the negotiations about how bills and legislation gets made. But this focus on, on what comes after that. What happens after these bills are passed? Where does the trillions of dollars in spending go? And so we're really looking for some sort of accountability here. And oftentimes, there are communities that fall through the cracks, where the funding does not reach the communities that desperately need it. So in the next episode, we'll actually be focusing on COVID relief and the fraud of epic proportions that the Justice Department is investigating. We always remember those PPP loans that were meant to help some of the small businesses out there. Well, it turns out some small businesses were actually shut out of that funding because other Americans took advantage of it and they used that funding and they used fraud to buy homes and engagement rings and cars. So we'll be digging a little bit more into that in our next episode of Through the Cracks, Lindsay. All right, Rachel Scott from our nation's capital. Thanks so much. We look forward to seeing what you have coming up. Thanks. And we still have lots coming up. One of the greatest to ever hit the court, the documentary shining a new light on Bill Russell's fight for racial justice. But next, plant-based meats were once riding a high, but now things could be taking a turn. We take a look at the state of the industry by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. magic. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. People here have a motto, NFL or bust. From just a handful of high schools here have come nearly two dozen NFL players. We've got the greatest hits in NFL history. We got 45 caliber showcases here at the scene. Mr. Adams' CTE pathology was different. It was unusually severe. The entertainment has to stop. We gotta put the person first. There's a lot of pressure on kids to play in the NFL here in this town. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the music. <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live.
Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. Not so long ago, plant-based meats were riding high as the answer to the carnivorous cravings of consumers with health or environmental concerns. But it appears customers and investors alike are sticking a fork in fake meat. Here's a look by the numbers. Plant meat maker Impossible Foods has announced plans to lay off about 20% of its workforce amid falling sales. Competitor Beyond Meat made similar cuts late last year. Beyond stock fell nearly 83% last year. And while Impossible reports a 50% rise in sales last Last year, investors are doubting the product's short-term growth potential. Overall, plant-based meats seem to be losing some of their sizzle. For 22 months in a row, sales volume has been slipping. That's a 15% drop in supermarket sales and a 9% drop in restaurant orders. McDonald's ditched ideas of adding a McPlant burger this year. Buy the raw deal for fake meat. Some suspect that 53% of Americans who have not been buying it are too opposed to the idea to become future consumers. Others point out that just 38% of consumers now believe the processed faux meat is healthier than animal proteins. That's down from half in 2020. There is one bright spot on this meat substitute menu. Sales of frozen faux chicken nuggets and patties continue to rise sharply. And there's still much more ahead on Prime tonight. How thousands of Texans are still Still struggling one week after severe winter weather swept across the state. And the history making night at the Grammys from Viola Davis and Beyonce to Sam Smith and Bad Bunny, the barriers broken on music's biggest night. <laughs> much happening these days it's hard to keep up things change hour by hour minute by minute the historic weather that's now unfolding the worries on wall street we're bringing you the right now at a nationwide teacher shortage the right now look at the day ahead an alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest story world news now and america this morning america's number one early morning news today does feel a little different early mornings on abc news live This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic, We're baby. making magic. People here have a motto, NFL or bust. From just a handful of high schools here have come nearly two dozen NFL players. We've got the us. greatest hits in NFL history. We have 45 caliber showcases here at the city. Mr. Adams' CTE pathology was different. It was unusually severe. The entertainment has to stop. You gotta put the person first. There's a lot of pressure on kids to play in the NFL here in this town. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. You never know what you're going to get on this show. That's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, Whoopi! Is this mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely. Always. Absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right. They don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Police in Florida say two Missouri children reported missing nearly a year ago were found in a local supermarket. The two children had been reported missing from their home in Clay County just outside of Kansas City last March. This week, police in High Springs, Florida, not far from Gainesville, ran a routine vehicle check on a car at a local supermarket parking lot and learned the car belonged to the children's non-custodial mother, 36-year-old Christy Gilly. She's been arrested on an out-of-state fugitive warrant. The children have been reunited with family members. A week after a severe winter storm swept across the state, thousands of Texans are still without electricity. 25,000 homes and businesses around Texas' capital city had no power. Austin Energy General Manager Jackie Sargent describes last week's winter storm as hurricane-level devastation, with thousands of ice-laden trees taking out power lines. But unlike two years ago, the larger power grid held up. The family of Anthony Lowe, a disabled double amputee killed by police last week, are suing the city of Huntington Park, California. The attorney for Lowe's family is calling it a murder. But police say Lowe stabbed a man outside a gas station when officers approached him in his wheelchair. You will see officers attempt to remove, actually officers remove Lowe from the wheelchair. Police also say Lowe threatened officers with a 12-inch butcher knife and that officers tased him twice with no effect. Police say he then tried to throw the butcher knife at officers, which is when they opened fire. Lowe was pronounced dead on the scene. Today, outside Pittsburgh, one officer killed and another seriously wounded after responding to a domestic dispute call. The city of McKeesport, Pennsylvania, confirmed in a statement that Allegheny County police officers engaged in a shootout with the suspect before injuring him. Area schools were on lockdown while police searched for the suspect. The suspect exchanged gunfire with police and was eventually shot and injured. Both the suspect and the wounded officer are in stable condition. A singer, R. Kelly, is seeking a new trial in his federal case in Chicago. Kelly's legal team says a key witness lied under oath about whether she planned to sue Kelly for millions of dollars if convicted. The attorney says despite that claim, the woman hired experts to help her sue for $13 million in restitution. Kelly's lawyers say the singer deserves a new trial because of the woman's omission and prosecutor's failure to correct her on the witness stand. The woman was a key witness in the trial and claimed Kelly abused her as a teen. Controversial tabloid, the National Enquirer, has a new owner. The 97-year-old tabloid behind many bombshell celebrity and political scandals sold itself to brand acquisition company VVIP in December of 2018. The parent company of the Enquirer admitted to engaging in a practice known as catch and kill in order to help Donald Trump become president. The new owners say that the plan moving forward is to expand into TV, film, and podcasts. Welcome back. AMC Theater has announced a new ticket pricing initiative that has customers paying based on where their seat is located. The initiative, called Sightline at AMC, is described by the company as a way for moviegoers to, quote, now have the option to pay less or more for a movie ticket based on their seat selection. Sightline will only be applied to showtimes which begin after 4 p.m. and is not applicable on discount Tuesdays. Well, the Grammys certainly had a bit for everyone. Music's Golden Night from Smokey and Stevie to Bad Bunny's Puerto Rican pride and Beyonce's crowning achievement. ABC's Lara Spencer brings us some of the highlights. From Harry Styles As you are, you're special. to Lizzo In case made you believe, you're special. to an on-your-feet opening act by Bad Bunny. Music's Golden Night packed with stunning performances and star power. Because we are witnessing history tonight. But the throne belonging to the one and only queen herself, Beyonce. Beyonce. 
Beyonce breaking the record for most Grammy wins by an artist ever. I'm trying not to be too emotional. And I'm trying to just receive this night. Taking home her 32nd award for best dance electronic music album, emotional as she thanked those who have shaped her career and life. I'd like to thank my beautiful husband, my beautiful three children who are at home watching. I'd like to thank the queer community for your love and for inventing this genre. Beyonce! And Lizzo paying tribute to the Queen during her own acceptance speech for Record of the Year. In the fifth grade, I skipped school to see you perform. <laughs> you changed my life. Harry Styles is here tonight, everybody. Harry Styles walking away with the night's biggest prize, though, right. Album of the Year. And the Grammy goes to... Presented by a super fan great-grandmother from Ontario. <laughs> Harry Styles! This doesn't happen to people like me very often, and this is so, so nice. Adele, who said Dwayne Johnson was the one person she's always wanted to meet but never had the chance, finally got her moment during Trevor Noah's monologue. I don't, I don't have Dwayne Johnson here to write tonight, but um, I do have someone called The Rock. Adele meet The Rock, The Rock meet Adele. First time ever. Get up here, best friend, Adele. He was also there when she took home Best Pop Solo Performance. I just want to dedicate this to my son, Angelo. I wrote this first verse in the shower um, when I was choosing to um, change my son's life. And I love a piano ballad winning <laughs> any kind of a war because it's very old school and very brave. It was a night of first. Kim Petras making history with Sam Smith for Unholy. Sam graciously wanted me to accept this award because I'm the first uh, transgender woman to win this award. And a night of surprises. Bonnie Raitt stunning the audience when she won Song of the Year, edging out Beyonce, Adele, and Taylor Swift. I'm so surprised, I don't know what to say. This is just an unreal moment. The night about celebrating those who have paved the way. From Motown. To hip hop, marking 50 years with an incredible medley starring LL Cool J. Run DMC. Salt and Peppa. Busta Rhymes. Missy Elliott. And more. What a show. Our thanks to Lara Spencer for that. With 11 NBA championships and five MVP awards, Bill Russell is one of the greatest winners in the history of American sports. And with his platform, he fought to further the cause of equality for black Americans. Director and Oscar-nominated filmmaker Sam Pollard is here to discuss his new Netflix documentary, Bill Russell Legend, which features the last interview before the passing of this American icon. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Pollard. My pleasure, Lizzie. So as a, a, a fan of the game and, and also a champion of black storytelling, what what excited you most about directing this? Well, for me, it was being able to go back and look at somebody I grew up watching and listening to in the 60s. I used to, in my neighborhood, we used to have this dialogue about who was the best center of all time. Was it Bill Russell or Will Chamberlain? Mm -hmm. And I always used to side with Bill Russell because I thought, as a defensive player, he was phenomenal. You know, and he led the Lakers, I mean, the Celtics, to so many championships. So when I was, when the executive producer, Ross Greenberg, reached out to me. It was a no-brainer. No I said, yes, I really want to do this documentary, these two films. We've seen a lot of movement within basketball, for example, when it comes to racial justice. We know that, that Bill Russell, not only because of his career on the court, but also his work with racial justice um, off the court, helped him to get the, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Did anyone mention that, that they felt in some way that that was kind of a baton that, that he passed? I think Shaquille and Steph Curry, they all knew that he, he's the one that they stand on the shoulders of. That the legacy that what Bill Russell did as a player, not only on the court but off the court, really has sort of set the tone for what players like LeBron and Chris Paul 
what they've done today in terms of protesting and standing up for the rights of African-American people and people of color in the country. You got the last interview with Bill Russell before he passed. Yes. I'm curious to know uh, what he was like in that moment and, and for you as, as a director to be able to present that to us all. Well, he wasn't exactly in the greatest shape he, mm. you know, that he had been, but he was still able to sort of remember the past, to talk about what it was like growing up in Oakland, the idea that he had been the Harlem Globetrotters had reached out to him to become a member of the Globetrotters, how he turned them down because they thought they were clowns, mm. you know? So it was it was an honor to, you know, for me as a sports fan, somebody grew up watching Bill Russell, it was just an honor to be in his company, to be, uh, be you know, surrounded with the things that made him so special. They had um, an auction of lots of his memorabilia at the Boston Garden last October, and we went, and Bill came with his wife, Janine, and just to see him looking and watching all this stuff being auctioned off, his, his rings, his trophies, his jerseys, it was just a unique and special moment for me. Of course, uh, we are here in uh, Black History Month, and, and there's a lot being discussed, uh, particularly in Florida, about getting you know, critical race theory out of the classrooms, eliminating black history. From your perspective as, as a director, why is... Uh, sharing the black experience still so important in this country? Simply this, because it's the American experience. Mm. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand the full breadth of what it means to be an American. You know, for me growing up in America in the 50s and 60s, I was told the America that I should be focused on was Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, George Washington, you know, was the first president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was one of our greatest presidents. It took until my teens to understand there were people like George Washington Carver, Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. W.B. Du Bois, Zora Neale Hurston, Langston Hughes, and that they're American as much as those other people are. And we should need to understand the breadth of American history. Because if you do, then it makes you, from my perspective, a better American. All right, Sam Pollard, we thank you so much for being here. We want to let our viewers know that his two-part documentary, Bill Russell Legend, premieres Wednesday on Netflix. Before we go tonight, we return back to our top story for the image of the day, the scene in Idlib, Syria, as the cleanup begins following a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that left thousands killed and more than 10,000 injured. The international community is coming together to offer assistance to both Syria and Turkey in this tragic time, and that help, of course, cannot come soon enough. That is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, the dramatic rescue of a stranded boater on a capsized yacht. The unexpected twist that includes a connection to the Goonies movie. And the new AMC initiative that could either make or break your next trip to the movies. Perhaps they'll be more affordable or you could end up paying even more. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. He's got the moves that make your animals brew. He's like the Justin Bieber of the night. <laughs> that rocks. Shut up. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. We are honored ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic.
This is ABC News Live Prime. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. How lucky are we? ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. All new, streaming weeknights. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hey there, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. A large number of plants and animals in the United States are facing extinction. A leading cons conservation research group found that 40% of animals and 34% of plants are at risk of dying out, while 41% of ecosystems are facing a total collapse. Everything from crayfish and cacti to iconic American species such as the Venus flytrap are in danger of disappearing. A group analyzed data from its network of more than 1,000 scientists across the U.S. and Canada. Three tourists from the U.S. mainland were stabbed in Puerto Rico earlier today after police said someone told them to stop filming in a renowned seaside community known as La Perla. According to police, the confrontation began when one of the tourists who lives in South Carolina began filming a mobile hamburger cart and was told to stop and leave the area. Two of the tourists remain hospitalized, including one who was stabbed six times. No one has been arrested. AMC Theater has announced a new ticket pricing initiative that has customers paying based on where their seat is located. The initiative called Sightline at AMC is described by the company as a way for moviegoers to, quote, now have the option to pay less or more for a movie ticket based on their seat selection. Sightline will only be applied to showtimes which begin after 4 p.m. and is not applicable on discount Tuesdays. Devastation and despair in Turkey and Syria. Thousands were killed by a catastrophic earthquake. Aerials show demolished buildings and scenes resembling a war zone. Rescue workers are urgently scrambling to try to save lives. Survivors were shown trying to stay dry and warm amid the frigid temperatures by gathering round fires and bundling up. Lives and livelihoods decimated in a matter of minutes. ABC News foreign correspondent Marcus Moore is in Istanbul tonight. Tonight, the most powerful earthquake to hit Turkey in 100 years, striking in the middle of the night as millions were sleeping. Videos showing the moment that 7.8 magnitude quake hit. You can hear the shaking and see power flashes. This town plunged into darkness. The danger persisting through the day, clouds of debris billowing into the street as this building collapses, the region rocked by at least 75 aftershocks. First responders on the scene of this collapsed building when the one next to it comes crashing down too. This reporter covering the urgent search and rescue efforts when the earth shakes again, people running for their lives. You can hear the buildings collapsing. witnesses turning around to see this. <laughs> Moments later, spotting a mother and her children, racing yeah. to help them get to safety. Wait, wait, this man says, as the frantic search for survivors began before dawn. Rescuers pausing here to listen for signs of life. <laughs> and glimmers of hope as first responders pull this survivor from the debris. After daybreak in Syria, west of Aleppo, rescuers lifting an injured child from the rubble. And to the north of the city, saving this toddler. Her name is Raghat. But sadly, her mother and two siblings all killed. The little girl now staying with relatives. In Turkey, rescuers pulling this man out of a tiny crevice of a collapsed building. This survivor named Hulusi comparing the quake to doomsday. <laughs> Saying a building collapsed on him and his wife. He doesn't think she survived. <laughs> Across the quake zone, the death toll rising steadily throughout the day. We now know more than 3,700 people were killed. The sheer horror, rescuers recovering the body of a newborn baby. The infant's father overcome with grief, holding his baby, collapsing to his knees. <laughs> this woman named Imran, desperate for word from her daughter and her family. The bedroom was right over there, she says. And at this overwhelmed hospital, a doctor making this plea. We uh, have information that uh, hundreds of patients are still under the debris. Uh, the situation is too bad. We need urgent help. And tonight, those trapped in the debris screaming for help. Speak out loud, this man says. 
help, help a woman respond. At least 45 countries pledging support, including the United States. President Biden speaking with Turkey's President Erdogan late today, saying U.S. search and rescue teams are, quote, deploying quickly to the region. Really hard to watch that. Marcus Moore joins us now. Uh, Marcus, what's the plan going forward as far as continuing to search for survivors? We understand some inclement weather is also causing more difficulty. Yeah, Lindsay, there's an urgent effort still underway as we speak right now as they try to find uh, the people, the families, and, and everyday people uh, beneath the rubble. And that is work that will go on as long as it needs to happen. But the next 24 to 48 hours will be critical in the search for survivors. We know that more than 5,600 buildings fell here in Turkey and in Syria, trapping scores of people in the rubble. And as you mentioned, the weather here is brutally cold, below freezing temperatures, along with winter snow is now falling on those devastated towns and villages. Lindsay. All right, Marcus Moore for us reporting in from Istanbul. Thank you, Marcus. An urgent call to evacuate in Ohio tonight amid fears of an imminent explosion after a train carrying toxic chemicals derailed. Now the dangerous operation to drain the toxic liquid from inside the cars is underway. Once that's complete, there will be controlled burns to destroy the cars and to avoid a blast. Our Alex Prochet is in Ohio tonight with the latest. Tonight, that towering column of smoke and flames. Authorities burning chemicals at the site of the massive train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, 20 miles south of Youngstown. Five of those cars carrying vinyl chloride. It's used to make plastic. It's toxic and extremely flammable. Have you ever seen something like this? No, I've never experienced anything like this. Authorities deciding late today to conduct the controlled release, making small holes in the cars, draining the chemicals into a trench. Inside that trench will be flares lining that trench that then will light off the material. This allows us to control that operation and not have the car react and do it itself. Officials expanding the evacuation zone for a possible toxic plume from that release, now extending over the Pennsylvania border. Those in the red area, those in the red area, are facing grave danger of death if they are still in that area. Janet Meek and her family got out after officials warned of an imminent explosion late last night. It hit that something bad's gonna happen and we just need to, to leave. The 150-car Norfolk Southern Railroad train was headed to Pennsylvania from Illinois when it derailed Friday night. The NTSB is studying the train's data recorder and videos that may show mechanical issues with one of the rail cars. Our thanks to Alex. Now to the search for the remnants of that Chinese spy balloon off the coast of South Carolina. It was brought down over the weekend by a missile from an F-22 jet. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raditz has the details. Tonight, a military recovery crew combing a vast expanse of ocean, 15 football fields by 15 football fields wide, looking for pieces of that Chinese spy balloon. The balloon brought down over the weekend by a missile fired from an F-22 fighter jet. Break one. Last one. The balloon is completely destroyed. Boom! Oh, yeah. oh. Back on land, cameras capturing the spectacle. The Pentagon saying they have already recovered portions of the balloon, which spanned 200 feet and carried a technology bay the size of three buses. A special team trained in handling explosives heading out to the site in the event that the debris contains hazardous material. Unmanned underwater vehicles will sweep for scraps. Officials insist the U.S. will gather valuable information from the debris, already revealing new details. The balloon had propellers, they say, and a rudder. The balloon had the ability to, to maneuver itself, to speed up, to slow down, uh, and to turn. Senior administration officials say the balloon first entered American airspace over Alaska on January 28th before heading into Canada and then re-entering the continental U.S. last Tuesday. Came over to the United, into the United States from Canada. I uh, told the Defense Department wanted to shoot it down as soon as it was appropriate. The balloon was allowed to drift over the nation until Saturday. The Pentagon determined shooting it down over land would risk lives on the ground. Our thanks to Martha. 
Our thanks to Martha Raddatz. Now to President Biden's State of the Union address. It comes amid Americans' growing concern over the economy, the war in Ukraine, and those new tensions now with China. Let's get to ABC senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce. Uh, Mary, the president says that he's racked up some significant accomplishments, and it sounds like tomorrow he's planning on telling that story. He is, Lindsay. He is going to argue, especially on the economy. He's going to say the economy is heading in the right direction and that his policies are working. We expect him to highlight that shockingly strong jobs report from last month, the unemployment rate now at a 53-year low. And he will argue that his policies, like the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, are improving Americans' lives. But the president also knows that he is facing some real headwinds here. Our latest ABC News Washington Post poll showing that 4 in 10 Americans feel they are actually worse off financially now than when Biden took office. Our numbers also show that Americans have real concerns about Republicans' approach as well. The party's really digging in on this fight over the debt ceiling, how to raise that limit. They're demanding steep spending cuts. But our poll shows that just 26 percent support how Republicans are handling this issue. We also expect the president tomorrow night to touch on other issues like police reform. Of course, foreign policy will be a big issue as well. And looming large over everything, Lindsay, the upcoming presidential race. Tomorrow night is a chance for the president to outline why he feels he deserves another four years. All right, we'll see what he has to say. Mary Bruce from the White House for us. Thanks so much, Mary. Thank you. The FBI arrested two people in an alleged plot to attack energy substations across Baltimore on a single day. Prosecutors say they were fueled by a racist extremist ideology and aimed to, quote, completely destroy the city. Our Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas has more. Tonight, the FBI accusing two suspected radicals fueled by racial hate of plotting to target the city of Baltimore's electrical grid in the hopes of causing pain and chaos. The accused were not just talking, but taking steps to fulfill their threats and further their extremist goals. The FBI says this is Sarah Beth Clendaniel wearing a mask and holding an assault rifle. Her alleged plan is to shoot multiple electrical substations in the Baltimore area aiming to, quote, completely destroy this whole city. Clint Daniels' alleged partner in crime, Brandon Russell, the founder of the neo-Nazi group Adam Waffen, only recently out of prison for possessing illegal explosives. The FBI claims Russell wanted to inflict as much pain as possible on the predominantly black city of Baltimore, writing to an undercover FBI informant that he wanted to carry out the attack when there's the greatest strain on the grid. Russell stating that such an attack could lead to cascading failure, costing billions of dollars. Our thanks to Pierre. Now to another frightening close call on the runway, this time at the airport in Austin. A Southwest Airlines passenger jet was taking off as a FedEx cargo jet was coming in for a landing. So how did they both end up being directed to the same runway? ABC News' transportation correspondent Gio Benitez has the latest on that investigation. Tonight, an urgent federal investigation underway at the Austin airport after what could have been a devastating accident over the weekend. A near miss between a FedEx cargo jet and a Southwest Airlines passenger plane. FedEx 1432, heavy, clear to land. Air traffic control giving FedEx permission to land and soon after giving the okay for Southwest to enter that same runway to take off. Southwest, does it confirm on a row? Row on now. But less than 30 seconds later, Southwest abort. FedEx is on the go. Southwest forced to change course. The two planes coming within 100 feet of one another. We know it was less than 100 feet. They were in very close proximity to each other. Just last month at JFK, a Delta pilot slamming on the brakes after almost colliding with an American Airlines plane that crossed the wrong runway. Delta 1943, cancel takeoff clearance. Delta 1943, cancel takeoff flinch. And Lindsay, JFK Airport has an automated alarm system to warn pilots about potential collisions. Austin does not. It is very concerning that this happened twice. Lindsay? Geo, thank you. A dramatic rescue has an unexpected twist. It started with a Coast Guard rookie helping a stranded boater from a capsized yacht, but then things take a strange turn involving a man wanted by the law in connection to a popular 80s movie. Our Janae Norming has this fascinating story. It's the heart-pounding rough sea rescue with a head-scratching twist that started with this. Watch as a massive wave capsizes this yacht just before a Coast Guard rescuer could reach the stranded boater. I was telling him to get in the water 
and then uh, he kind of pointed over to the wave. It happened Friday, where the Columbia River meets the Pacific Ocean, known as the Graveyard of the Pacific for its notorious 20 to 30 foot waves. Rookie Coast Guard rescue swimmer Petty First Class John Branch Walton rappelling from a helicopter down to the rough waters. His first rescue. There he is in the water swimming to the boat, then the wave. I tried to duck it. I didn't get hit as bad as the boat, and then I popped up. The rescue helicopter sends down a hook and helps Walton relocate the survivor, attaching the man to the rescue device, pulling 35-year-old Jericho Labonte to safety. He was taken to the hospital with mild hypothermia and then the twist. That yacht stolen, and the man rescued from the water wanted. The video from the Coast Guard was posted on Twitter and at that point, he was recognized as our suspect. Recognized from another video, security footage showing him placing a fish on the front porch of this home, made famous in the 1980s cult classic, The Goonies. I just saw the most amazing thing in my entire life. First, you gotta do the truffle shuffle. <laughs> he put the dead fish on the porch uh, put stickers over the security camera to block the lens and then danced around the property. The movie also featuring a fish. <laughs> but unlike the Goonies. Come on, guys. This is our time. For Labonte, this adventure has come to an end. Fascinating stuff. Our thanks to Janae for that. And still to come, much more. A rising death toll. What triggered deadly landslides in Peru? But next, NHL player Akeem Aliyu shares his remarkable story and why it's fueling his fight to diversify hockey and try to eradicate racism in youth sports. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is abc news live america's number one streaming news free to you 24 7. watch america's number one news whenever you want it wherever you are anytime abc news live streaming live and free on all platforms bring them on if only there was a place in the morning to start my day with a smile Somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I like you. Yes. Like so what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is America's number one streaming news. ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. What are the secrets that most people don't know? Let me see your ID card. Wait, 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 wait. This is a world you will have to live in. There's no going back. Welcome back. We're tracking several headlines around the world. A landslide in Peru triggered by strong rains killed at least eight people in one of the country's southern regions. Officials are still trying to assess the damage, but local media, they have reported a higher death toll. The deadly landslide follows nearly two months of anti-government protests in the South American country. Greece's most famous landmark, the Acropolis, was blanketed in snow after a cold front moved into the country, bringing the first winter snowfall to the Athens capital. Authorities preemptively closed schools and some roads and shops. Greece has witnessed a mild winter until now. 
In Thailand, it's Muay Thai Day to celebrate more than 3,600 boxers performed a ceremony beating the Guinness World Record for the largest pre-fight dance, showing respect to teachers, parents, and ancestors. The sport is known as the art of the eight limbs, as boxers are allowed to strike opponents with combinations of legs, knees, elbows, and fists. The previous record for this title was 250 people. Our next guest is a former NHL hockey player with a remarkable story. Akeem Aliyu is a Ukrainian, Nigerian, Canadian who at the age of 10 discovered his love for hockey. Now he's a leader in the movement to diversify hockey and to try to eradicate racism in youth sports. And he's out with a new graphic memoir called Dreamer, sharing his story about pursuing his dream of hockey and overcoming racism along the way. Akeem, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. As I was just explaining to you, my son got this in the mail, read it in one night, loved Loved it. It really is all encompassing about your journey as far as your love for hockey, your life as an immigrant. How did the, the book come about and, and why did you decide to make it a graphic novel? I think um, to be able to tell a story through pictures was really important for me. I think that my upbringing is a lot different than most kids that play hockey, but I think most kids in general, before the age of 10, I lived in three different continents. So I just got to see the world in a little bit of a different way. And moving to Canada was really difficult for our family, um, really tough to make ends meet. My financial background wasn't the same as it was for all. And then on top of that, um, I was one of the only kids of color that was playing it all the way, all the way up. It's really a story of perseverance and, and, and overcoming obstacles. And yeah, it's about sports, but it's about life lessons that I think that, that, that I want to instill in the next generation of not giving back, of not giving up and always following your dreams and continue to dream and have faith. Hey, you brought that up of, of not giving up. Were there times where the racism was so bad that you thought about quitting? And in those moments, what allowed you to persist? Yeah, it was it was awful. I mean, I felt like I finally achieved um, my ultimate dream of being a kid that was born in Africa and making it to the NHL. Um, and then at every stage, I dealt with issues on race. Um, in Colorado, I had the uh, trainer dress up with, as me in blackface. I had a coach called me the N-word in the professional ranks. Um, things in the book around the hazing and other racial discrimination that I dealt with um, in junior hockey. but. For me, I, I had to continue um, because it was a means to provide for my family. Um, and that was an added pressure that I think a lot of kids, especially in hockey, um, don't have. So I knew that I, quitting was not an option for me. But the culture of silence in the game was very difficult and it was one of the reasons why I didn't speak out earlier because I knew that everything I battled for my entire career and providing for my family would be taken away at the snap of a finger. Your mom is Ukrainian, dad is Nigerian, grew up initially in Kyiv, then you moved to Canada. Yep. What made you get into ice hockey to begin with? And right away, was it apparent to you that the, the cultural differences? Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things, as most folks know in Canada, it's almost a religion there. It's, it's everywhere. It's, I think, in a lot of ways what football is here. Um, everywhere you look, billboards, commercials, signs, it's, it's all about hockey. Um, all my all my friends in school were playing it and I always felt left out um, and then when I wanted to get into the game my parents were like hey we can't afford this like mm. this is just something that's not feasible for us right now um, but I continued to push um, and 100% there was times I wanted to give up because it was it was just so difficult you talked uh, briefly about the hazing incident in 2005 that made national headlines and people were trying to label you as problematic in the locker room. Yeah. Talk to me about a little more specifically about how your race and background made your experience in ice hockey arguably more difficult than it should have been. Well, I think for sure, I think there's a lot of subconscious biases that went through me playing the game. Um, Obviously, with the hazing incident, it was a thing that made me wait longer to come out around the racial issue because even when I felt like I stood up to um, something that's morally wrong and something that continues to happen in our society, and I just never understood how hazing welcomes people into an, an environment. And when I stood up for that, um, I feel like there was racial biases and that I ended up being the problem because I didn't get along to get along. Um, and the excuse that people made was, this has been going on for so long, why don't you just continue? Um, and I just said, because it's wrong. It's, and then all you ever hear after that is, hey, he's a bad kid, he's hard to get along with this and that. But when you really dig into it and say, well, how, how so? There's never really any answers. 
You're right that, like many minority athletes, I also see the horrible messages people send on social media. It's relentless, and each one hits you a different way. Sometimes I feel sad for the person. Sometimes I feel scared. It's a constant reminder that what we're fighting for is something that needs fighting for. Are you optimistic about some of the change that you've been able to create, or, or are we still so far away from where we need to be? Yeah, I mean, what's, what's difficult for us is the actual league that we all grew up um, dreaming to play of as players of color has not really stepped up for us and that's the National Hockey League. Um, we went to them right away and said hey we want to create diversity programs, we want to create grassroots and educational programs and um, they felt that they had it all handled so that's been really difficult but we've gotten a lot of support and a lot of allyship um, through the grassroots programs that we run where we're providing hockey completely free of cost to more than 500 kids um, across the Toronto area and we're looking to expand into the US. Um, so people do know that um, change is needed. Um, I think this work is really important. You look at the league like the National Hockey League, it's 96% white on the ice, and that's a problem. And I truly believe diversity is morally right, but it's also good for the sport and it's good for the bottom line. The more people you have interested playing the game, the better the product's going to be on the ice. Akeem, we thank you so much. We want to let our viewers know that you can find his graphic memoir, Dreamer, available tomorrow wherever books are sold. Congratulations and good luck. Thank you so much for having me. And still to come, it's an activity that once had her fearing she'd go to jail, but now a nine-year-old is receiving a rare recognition while she's now being honored by Yale University. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right guys? Bring your friends. Oh wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom, boom, boom. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. After an extraordinary news-making year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. He may not look like central casting for a movie star hero, but what he did and how he risked it all to save hundreds of lives from terror are what heroes are made of. Really? That guy? What's the life and death truth behind what he did? Truth and Lies, The Informant. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Finally tonight, from fear of going to jail to attending Yale, it's the incredible journey of a little girl from New Jersey who loves the greenery of her home state. Nine-year-old Bobby Wilson is an environment enthusiast. Last October, in an effort to save the trees in her New Jersey neighborhood from the spotted lanternfly, she, got one? she was testing a natural homemade insect spray. Yes, good job. Bobby even stomped them as part of a campaign to see it squish it. She was collecting the lantern flies and using the spray to combat the invasive insects that feed on trees. But her efforts were cut short when a police officer arrived after receiving a complaint from a neighbor. The neighbor reported the fifth grader as a suspicious person. The incident made the news, catching the attention of a professor at Yale University School of Public Health who decided to recognize and honor the young scientist. Professor Ijoma Opara telling the audience, Yale doesn't normally do anything like this. This is something unique to Bobby. We wanted to show her bravery and how inspiring she is, and we just want to make sure she feels honored and loved. Professor Apara organized an event to celebrate Bobby and introduce her to other black female scientists. Entomologists at Yale's Peabody Museum helped Bobby catalog and mount her collection of 27 spotted lanternflies. Her collection is now officially entered into the museum's database where it will forever be associated with her name as the donor scientist. Bobby's message to us all tonight. I want to let every young boy or every young girl or even adults know that nobody can knock you off your way to success and we all can do our, our part to save the environment just like me. 
Bobby, already a celebrated scientist. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. We'll be right back.